a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jokla 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, Sunday, the 12th of November 2017, I'm going to read to you the next 11th part of the wonderful book that Martin Luther wrote in 1545, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. A book where Martin Luther calls a spade a spade, and the Antichrist the Antichrist. He does not save any words, he is not politically correct, as probably as I am not politically correct, and I don't care. Martin Luther calls a spade a spade. He calls the Antichrist an ass pope. He calls him a liar, a cheater, a blasphemer. He calls him, in the biblical terms, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the little horn, everything that he is. And Martin Luther is right. And I only ask myself, and you know of course that I am of German roots, where is that spirit today? Where is that spirit today in Germany? Where is that spirit today in Europe? Anywhere? Where is that sp spirit today anywhere? Where is that spirit today to call something out for what it really is? In the media you will never find anybody who speaks out. Because all media is controlled. And I am not speaking of the alternative media, which is also controlled, there they use some hard expressions sometimes, but, you know, they are all in the game. And in the mainstream media, of course, you will never find anybody who really speaks the truth, and calls a spade a spade, and calls the Antichrist the Antichrist, that he really is. Therefore, you have to go to very, very few YouTube channels or other people who really hold up this teaching and share this with everybody. Like for example I do in Hour of the Truth or on my YouTube channel and Dr. 66. Of course like wonderfully Tom Fress does. Every day in First Amendment Radio, Monday through Friday, in his broadcasts, where for the moment he reads exactly the same book that I am reading here now. And I can tell you that was not uh, agreed on the two of us that we read this book together it just came out this way because I advised him a long time ago already to read this book when brother Brett Norman sent this one as well to me as he sent it to Tom Fress so it all comes together in this time at the end of the year 2017 round about a little bit before and a little bit after the time of the 500th anniversary of the quote-unquote Reformation Day of the day when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg or the castle door in Wittenberg <coughs> and um, you know Tom does his job I do mine but I would very much appreciate it if everybody who listens to my readings here also opens the playlist that I integrate into the description box of all the videos and you go to the playlist in First Amendment Radio on the YouTube channel of uh, Nicholas Arthur's First Amendment Radio and you click on listening on Tom Press reading the same book against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil and uh, because Tom probably speaks about things that I do not address that much and maybe I speak about some things, some things that Tom doesn't mention that much. But I can assure you I did not listen to one of his readings because I don't want to get influenced by those. And uh, 
if I would listen to Tom's readings first and then do my own, I would probably here and there start parroting him. <laughs> That's the least thing that I want to do. I have my own reasons and motivations why I ever started this book. And that's because when I discovered this one uh, quote of this book on the internet, I wanted to have this book, and we are coming to that quote on page 363, but for the moment we are on page 328, and that's where I want to pick up the reading today. Uh, we finished on the second paragraph, meaning we finished the very first paragraph on the page 328, but I'm going to retreat one paragraph and start on the top of the page for continuity sakes, and also because the second paragraph, of course, reflects of something that is written in the first. So I go back and I start reading to you on the top of the page 328 in the book Church and Ministry. Luther's Works, Volume 41, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. For the Pope, or rather the evil spirit in him, knows quite well that if the rock, Christ, and the building on it, faith in Christ, were to remain, and if the words, quote, on this rock I will build my church, unquote, should be understood as, quote, my Christians should and shall believe in me, Unquote, then he could have done nothing, or nor could he be made Pope. I think I've found one of the very rare <laughs> printing errors in this book. Then he could have done nothing, nor could he have made a Pope. Um, well, if Martin Luther, of course, speaks about Satan, then he speaks in the right direction. But I think it should read, then he could have done nothing, nor could he have been made a pope. I think that is the way that we are better understand that, because we are speaking about the pope, as we can read in the beginning of the sentence. Anyway, what can you do with these words? Quote, my church will be built on me, the rock. It will believe in me, trust in me, and depend on me, unquote. What can you make of these words, I say, except that all Christians, or the whole of Christendom, and anyone claiming to be a Christian, will believe in Jesus Christ, and put their trust in Him, as they put their trust on a rock, so that even the gates of hell, that is all the devils, may not harm them. No Pope can admit or tolerate this meaning, since it does not refer us either to Pope, bishops, or to any human being, be he king or emperor, but assembles us all under the Son, under the only Son of God, the true rock of our salvation, assembles us so completely upon Christ alone, that we have to forsake even ourselves and our good works, and be made just and holy solely through faith in him. This is a very important last sentence. It says, assembles us so completely upon Christ alone, yeah, that we have to forsake even ourselves, and that is written in the Bible, and our good works, well, our works, and this is something very interesting, uh, Luther has a saying here, and I'm going to look that up for you, so that quote from Martin Luther is, Our works do not generate righteousness, rather our righteousness in Christ generates works. Very important little sentence, and I know that we spoke about that last time, but I wanted to repeat that once more, because in the book it says that we even have to forsake ourselves, meaning, like Jesus Christ said, give up everything you have, take up your cross and follow me, and we have to forsake our good works, and our good works, and this is then very important to understand for a Christian, is that in the sense that, Martin, as Martin Luther says here, that our works do not generate righteousness, rather our righteousness in Christ generates works. We do these good works because we are saved, not because we want to be saved. That's the big difference with the quote-unquote policy of the Roman Catholic Church, and, of course, um, what do you find in 
Protestantism in true Bible believing Christians and their dogma, the Bible. Yeah? These good works are an expression of us being saved, not because we are saved. And adhering to the Ten Commandments, of course, is the same thing. We don't keep the law because we want to be saved, we keep the law because we are saved, because in this way we show our respect and our love for our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all Ten Commandments. Anyway, Martin Luther continues here, this is why the evil spirit had to invent a different, false meaning for this passage and say, quote, Rock means Saint Peter, and the Pope, or their authority, which is the same thing. To build on it means to be obedient to the Pope. If it no longer means whoever believes in Christ shall be saved, but whoever is obedient to the Pope shall be saved, a Pope could result, but he, the Pope himself, as the rock, should be neither obedient nor subject to anyone. Now this is exactly the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church says that without her, or outside her, there is no salvation possible. In the Bulla of Unam Sanctum of 1302 from Pope Boniface VIII, we read that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. This is exactly what Martin Luther says here, in other words. And in Roman Catholic canon law, the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Pope is judge of all men and not to be judged by any man. And we get into that a little bit deeper even in the rest of this book reading. But that's something that we really have to understand here. Okay? And Martin Luther cuts on this a little bit already here in the beginning now. A Pope could result, but he, the Pope himself, as the rock, should be neither obedient nor subject to anyone. That means the Pope is like Aleister Crowley. Do as your thou will shall be the whole of the law. The Pope says I make all the laws, but I don't have to adhere to them, because I am above the laws. And he is not only that for himself, he also puts that into his complete clergy of the Roman Catholic Church. And they are immune, because they, the Roman Catholic Church is a state within a state, and thereby their laws are accounted for the clergy, and not the civil laws of the country they live in. But I don't want to go too far away from the reading here now, I just want to make the point, and for everybody who does not know that that good, to pick it up here and do your own research, you know. I can read here until the cows come home. If you don't do your own research and understand what I say by your own research in the Bible and in other secular books like the one that I'm reading here from Martin Luther, then this is all done in vain, this work. Because you don't accept anything that I say only because I say it. You should only accept anything that I say because I say it with the authority of the Bible. Well, the Pope says you should only uh, believe anything that I say because I say it, because I stand above the Bible. I am God. And I am teaching. I teach the Bible. I teach Jesus crucified. And by that I adhere to sola scriptura, what the Pope doesn't do. Because the Pope says that his writings are even standing above the Bible. Yeah? That's the difference between me and the Pope, for example. Huh? There you have the summary and complete meaning of the canon law and all the decretals from which you can obviously see that the Pope and his papacy is the spirit of the devil and derives from a distorted, falsified interpretation of Matthew chapter 16. That is out of lies and blasphemies, born out of the rear end of the devil. Born out of the rear end of the devil. I put some pictures in the video where you can see how the Pope is born out of the ass of the devil, to use another word that Martin Luther also uses frequently. 
How the Pope is born out of the rear end of the devil. The devil farts and the Pope comes out. That is why no good has come of the papacy. <laughs> no good has ever come of the papacy. Rather, what has come is the ruin of faith. What has come is false legends, blasphemous idolatry of our own works, as well as corruption of worldly estates, murder, every kind of trouble and such abominable fornication as can now be seen openly in Rome, for which he has stolen bishoprics and all the possessions of Christendom, and even from kings. Now what would the Pope, who as much who has made such a horror huh? now what would the Pope who has made such a horror and furor of confusion out of this blessed and comforting passage regarding faith in Christ have earned and learned I add he belongs in the court of hell all the torments of, on earth would be too mild further that which follows, quote, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, as we can read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Can, as we have heard, mean nothing else but that the dear Lord and true Bishop of our souls left us the power to bind and loose sin. There must be discipline and punishment in the church for the sake of the wild, impudent people, but also hope and consolation for the sake of the fallen ones, so that they do not think their baptism is now invalid, as the Novationists, but even more the Pope, have thought. Now, what are the Novationists? Let me go into a little footnote and I explain to you that word that you probably have not heard yet. Novationists, this is named after Novation. He's a presbyter, meaning an elder, because that's what the word presbyter means, in Rome, who was elected counterbishop against Cornelius in 251. He and his followers insisted upon the permanent exclusion of those church members who had committed a quote-unquote deadly sin, or had left the church under the pressure of persecution. He, we are speaking still about Novation, was martyred in 257 or 258. That is not that clear. The thing that I do not agree with in this little article is, of course, uh, saying but who had committed a quote-unquote deadly sin. The Bible does not speak about a deadly sin. The Bible speaks about the law and sins and that the transgression of the law is sin. And actually all sins deserve death. Because when you sin and you do not repent then you are lost and you will die in this life and in the afterlife you will be judged and you will be thrown into the lake of fire so in other words very simple when you sin and do not repent you are killed alright so deadly sin well every sin is deadly if you don't repent you know, the law was made to condemn us, but grace is imputed to us so that the condemning law has no grip on us anymore. But therefore does that not mean that the law is gone and done away with? That it is not. It's very important that we understand this, that the law is still in working. But as the law can only condemn in the new covenant, covenant we have grace but it is not that because we have grace we can now start sinning as we want to because then Christ would have died in vain but all of this what I'm telling you right now you can read in the book of Romans and you can read in the book of the Corinthians if I'm not mistaken look it up for yourself <laughs> But the point is that I wanted to make here with this novation, 
when it says here members who had committed a deadly sin or had left the church under the pressure of persecution he was martyred in 257 or 258 this quote unquote deadly sin in my opinion at least does not exist every sin is deadly or punished with death if you don't repent and that's actually biblical because in the Bible it says that sinning is the transgression of law and the wages of sin is death that's what the Bible says so every sin is quote unquote a deadly sin that's why I would not make the distinction the translators do here in this little footnote so let's go back and read the sentence again there must be discipline and punishment in the church for the sake of the wild impudent people but also hope and consolation for the sake of the fallen ones so that they do not think their baptism is now invalid as the novationists but even more the Pope have taught so we see that Martin Luther explains here that the uh, teaching of the novationists and of course the Pope are wrong now this binding and loosing Martin Luther continues is not enough for the Pope since he cannot rule over the other over the others thereby because even ordinary ministers and chaplains must have such binding and loosing in summary it belongs to faith too and not to obedience to the Pope as was said above that is why he has interpreted it differently and better like this quote, whatever you bind command establish and will on earth shall uh, and will on earth shall be commanded established and willed in heaven and whoever does not obey you and keep these things shall not attain salvation etc <laughs> this is how in Pope's speech you read Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 want me to repeat that again this is how the Pope interprets that whatever you bind the Pope command establish and will on earth shall be commanded established and willed in heaven and whoever does not obey you the Pope and keep these things shall not attain salvation unquote etc what do you think of this fella huh what do you think of this fella who interprets the word of God like this just look whether the Roman Catholic Church that is the papal hellish scum does not rightly boast of being the mother of all churches and mistress of the faith when we are supposed to do what one of the most malicious rogues on earth commands and wills to be done irrespective of whether God forbid it or doesn't wish it he know he now therefore now <laughs> he now forces the word of Christ someday I'm gonna learn how to read <laughs> that's something I have with Tom and Carmen he also has it sometimes and then he says someday I'm gonna learn how to read I'm sorry <laughs> he now forces the word of Christ our dear Lord in Matthew 16 Kudunk everything into this meaning and makes much use of it in his papal decretals quote whatever you bind etc whatever should mean not sin which is the only thing Christ speaks of but everything that is on earth churches bishops emperors kings perhaps also all the farts of all the donkeys and his own farts too Oh, my dear brother in Christ, when I hear or elsewhere speak so coarsely about the loathsome, accursed, atrocious monster in Rome, be sure to credit it to me. He who knows my thoughts must say that I do far, far too little to him, and that I can with neither words nor thoughts do justice to the abominable, desperate blasphemy he commits, with the word and name of Christ our dear Lord and Savior and afterward he laughs up his sleeve <laughs> as though he had successfully mocked Christ the fool and his Christians who believe his glosses and yet he pretends to pump as though 
he were the vicar of Christ and wanted to save the whole world with his sanctity. He martyrs the word on earth in the same way as far as the earth extends that far I have to bind that is to command to establish and to order and the whole world owes me obedience the dear Lord and Bishop of our souls Jesus Christ as in First Peter 3 uh, says meant, in the, uh, meant it this way quote what you bind or loose here below shall be bound or loosed up there in heaven. For here on earth I am with you until the end of the world. Matthew 28 verse 20 He did not mean that the whole earth physically should be obedient to the Pope. But what we Germans call here below, he calls on earth. What we call up above, he calls in heaven. No sovereignty is thereby given to either bishops or churches here on earth. For Christ's kingdom is a spiritual and heavenly kingdom and, although it is on earth and must live in the flesh, it nevertheless does not rule in the flesh, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. But here one must accept the Most Holy Father who has a higher spirit than Christ himself. Therefore, we must believe only his decretals and not the Holy Spirit of Christ or even God, his Father. For he is against and above God, as St. Paul says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And I am not going back into that very important passage of the Bible of Second Thessalonians 2, but as I told you, I have an agreement with Tom Fress that one of these days when he has time and fixed his microphone and he will have time that we will come together and do a recording and reading and analyzing Second Thessalonians 2 in completion that you will absolutely have the right understanding we will make that sure that's why I do not go any farther into this right now I have done so in the past Second Thessalonians 2 is exactly the part of the Bible where there is left no doubt to anyone on who the Antichrist really is. And in the verses 3 and 4 it says because that he, the Pope, is against and above God. That is something that we can read there. So, for the sake of uh, uh, understanding this correctly, I just go to Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3 and 4 and there we read let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of petition who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God unquote Second Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4 now this is a very important part of uh, Second Thessalonians 2 because we, as, as I said to you earlier in this quote from Martin Luther where he says our works do not generate righteousness rather our righteousness in Christ generates works is one part and the other part is that we really have to understand that the Pope sits himself in the temple of God claiming to be God and the temple of God is the body of Christ the body of believers that's where he comes out of in 321 already of course yeah? so that's why this is very important for us to understand and um, as Martin Luther says here in the book but here one must accept the most holy father who has a higher spirit than Christ himself that's what he claims you know it's not that it is that way but that's what he claims um, the Holy Father, quote unquote Holy Father. Therefore, we must believe only his decretals. Now, we must only believe the decretals, the bulls, the writings of the canon law, the teachings and the dogmas of the Satanic Roman Catholic Church, and not the Holy Spirit, or even Christ himself, or even God, who is the Father of our Savior Jesus Christ. For he is against and above God, the Pope. 
as St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. That's why I just read that to you. Now, and here it becomes quite evident, Luther continues, that the Pope must be possessed and full of devils to have so completely lost all sense and reason. For Christ's words about the keys are without doubt a divine, strong promise. Quote, Whatever you bind shall be bound. Unquote. This must be fulfilled, for God must not and cannot lie, since he is not Pope or Cardinal, what he promises he will firmly and surely keep, as we read in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Now let me just go there, because as long as I have my 1611 King James Bible open, I love it when we can uh, do these little quotes from the Bible whenever they are mentioned here in the book. 7 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13 states, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. God is incapable of lying. Every man is capable of lying. Maybe the one or the other doesn't want to, but he is able to. God is not even able to lie. That's the big difference. Therefore, in Timothy we read, he cannot deny himself. And that's what he do, what he would do if he lied. God can not lie. Now ask the histories whether St. Peter was Lord over the whole world, as the Pope interprets the words. Here either Christ must be a liar, who did not keep his word, or the Pope must be a desperate, blasphemous villain who has put the lies into our Lord's mouth that he gave St. Peter and him, by apostolic succession, temporal power over the whole world, although the Turk is still strong enough now to say no to this, to say nothing about what the rest of the world does. Now, should I, as a Christian, and all the lovers of our Lord Jesus Christ, not rightfully be impatient, angry and intolerant, and moreover curse the accursed Pope, and call him the most abominable things, since he is not ashamed to blaspheme our Lord most abominably, and make his promises into lies? It is not only untrue that Christ, with the words, whatever you bind on earth, promised Peter power over all the world, but it is also untrue that St. Peter or the popes actually received, brought into being, or took possession of such power. All a lie. And just so that no one thinks I, Martin Luther, say such things about the Pope out of emotions or fury, and that goes for me, Jörg, from Jogler 66, in the same way, let us hear his own words. In, and there we go into a little footnote here. This is uh, 151, okay. In this... Uh, that's an uh, abbreviation, 22 Omnes, uh, which we can find on page 307. So I retreat to page 307 to see what this is referring to. And then we have to look into footnote number 105. That is the Decreta Prima Pars, uh, distance uh, 22, um, where this is written down. Uh, in this 22 Omnes, Pope Nicholas, who is Nicholas II, who reigned between 1058 and 1061, says, when, uh, which has been mentioned above, quote, The Roman Church has founded and instituted all the churches, be they patriarchate, patriarchates, archbishoprics, primates, or of whatever dignitaries or orders they are. But it, the Roman one, 
was instituted and set on the rock of newborn faith solely by him who gave Peter the key bearer of eternal life, the power and authority over both earthly and heavenly kingdoms. Thus the Roman Church was not instituted by any earthly verdict, but by the word through which heaven and earth and all the elements were created. It has its privilege from him who established it. Hence, there is no doubt that whoever takes away a right from other churches does wrong, but whoever intends to take away the privileges of the Roman Church, which the supreme head of all the churches had given it, falls into heresy. And just as the former should be rebuked as a wrongdoer, the latter should be rebuked as a heretic. Unquote. Very, very important sentence that we read here of Antichrist, Pope Nicholas II, who reigned between 1058 and 1061, only three little years. But listen again to what Pope Nicholas says here. The Roman Church was founded and instituted, uh, the Roman Church has founded and instituted all the churches, be they patriarchates, archbishoprics, primates, or of whatever dignitaries or orders they are. So, he says that the Roman Church is on the basis of it all. I don't know where the Pope Nicholas II gets this from, because we all know that in the book of Acts it is written that the Christians in Antioch were the first called Christians, not in Rome. I don't know where he gets that from, but of course of his lie of apostolic succession, I guess, and we know that is Simon Peter, uh, Simon <laughs> Simon Magus and not Simon Peter. That's the way. But continue in the, uh, in, in the quote here. But it, meaning the Roman one, the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church, was instituted and set on the rock of newborn faith solely by him who gave Peter the key bearer of eternal life, the power and authority over both earthly and heavenly kingdoms. So here we see that Pope Nicholas II does the same as all the other popes do. They pervert, twist around 180 degrees the words of Matthew 16. Thus the Roman Church was not instituted by any earthly verdict. So here, with this little sentence, Pope Nicholas II denies that Emperor Phocas in 606 gave the spiritual power to the Bishop of Rome and gave him the power of the Western Church and the Eastern Church together so that he may be called Universal Bishop, the one that Pope Gregory, or better said the Bishop of Rome, Gregory, just before Boniface III, um, warned about that if any bishop should take the title universal bishop, he is a precursor of Antichrist. Huh? So it says, thus the Roman Church was not instituted by any earthly verdict. So, here the Pope says, we were not established by Emperor Phocas, but by the Word, through which heaven and earth and all the elements were created. So, by Jesus Christ himself. This is what the Pope claims here. It has its privilege from him who established it. So, the privilege of the Roman Catholic Church is being given to him, to the Pope, and to the Roman Catholic Church by Jesus Christ. This is what the Pope claims. Hence, there is no doubt that whoever takes away a right from other churches does wrong. But whoever intends to take away the privilege of the Roman Church, which the supreme head of all the churches had given it, falls into heresy. So you see, when you take away any of the power of any other church, then you do wrong. But when you try to take away any of the power of the Roman Catholic Church, then you fall into heresy. Whereas the Bible describes heresy as if you not adhere to the word of God, not to the word of man. And only the word of man comes out of the Roman Catholic Church. So I hope you see the distinction here. And continue the quote. And just as the former, meaning the one who 
takes away from other churches does wrong, just as the former should be rebuked as a wrongdoer, so the latter, the one who takes away from the power of the Roman Catholic Church, should be rebuked as a heretic. And that is how they define heretics from out the Roman Catholic Church. Because when you either take away anything of the power or authority of the Roman Catholic Church, or you do not adhere to the power and authority of the Roman Catholic Church, then you are a heretic. Now you can also go back to my book reading of Rulers of Evil, and there I speak in one of the chapters about the Directorium Inquisitorum. And there is a very fine definition of who a heretic is, and what is to be done with them. Go to my book reading Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy and you will learn that. I don't go into that here right now again. But you hear there that Christ's word, quote, on this rock I will build my church, unquote, ought not mean that the whole of Christendom should believe in Jesus Christ, but rather only the Roman church was instituted by Jesus Christ. This is how the popes twist the truth. How they take the words of Christ and give it a spin so that they say this is the way that it has to be understood. Yeah? So you hear Christ's word, on this rock I will build my church, and we know that with this rock he means the faith, the faith in him, he who is the rock, ought not to mean that the whole of Christendom should believe in Jesus Christ, but rather only the Roman church was instituted by Jesus Christ. Therefore all other churches are daughters of the quote-unquote mother church. And that is what we have today, in 2017, in the aftermath of uh, the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, that all the quote-unquote daughters of the whore come back under the wings of Rome. This is why Rome never ever accepts any other quote-unquote Christian denomination as a sister church. They only accept them as a daughter. And the daughter has to be obedient to the mother. And the daughter has to come back to the mother. Only the Roman church was instituted by Jesus Christ, does the Pope say in his decretals and canon laws and bulls and decrees. And he cannot prove it because he twists the word of our Lord Jesus Christ in that way, that he makes it understood this way. Therefore, we really need to have the Bible up. We should put up the whole armor of God, and we should always have a Bible in our reach to understand that when we read things like this, that this is a satanic delusion, that this is a satanic derivation of the word of God that this is a satanic explanation of the word of God, not how Jesus Christ intended it, but how the dragon intends it to be understood, so that he is worshipped. Because that's what he wanted, as he said in Isaiah 14. Hmm? All the other churches, Martin Luther continues, that is, all of Christendom were instituted not by Christ, but by the Roman Church. The dear Lord Christ knows of no more than one church in the whole world, which he builds on himself, the rock, through faith. But the Pope makes two kinds of churches. The Roman, which alone was instituted on the rock by Christ, and the other churches, which were instituted not by Christ, but by perhaps the devil, or, to put it much more mildly, the Roman Church. Again, the keys should not bind and loose sin, as our Lord said, but give the Pope power and authority over all earthly and heavenly kingdoms. I must stop here.
I must stop here, Martin Luther says. I can no longer rummage in the blasphemous, hellish devil's filth and stench. Someone else may read too. He who wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. He who wants to hear the devil speak should read the Pope's decretals and bulls. Oh, woe, woe, woe unto him who comes along and becomes Pope or Cardinal. It would be better for him if he had never been born. Judas betrayed and killed the Lord, but the Pope betrays and brings ruin upon the Christian Church which the Lord held more precious and dearer than himself or his blood, for he sacrificed himself for it. Woe unto you, Pope! A very powerful statement of Martin Luther. He writes himself into an anger that I can absolutely understand. That's why he even starts the sentence and says, I must stop. I cannot do any more allegements against the Pope here. I have proven more than enough that the scripture says one thing and the Pope, the quote-unquote vicar of Christ, says another thing. That the curia, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the magisterium, and think about why it is called magisterium from Magi, Simon Magi, Simon Magus, yeah, that he cannot continue that. That's why he said here, I must stop. I can no longer rummage in the blasphemous, hellish, devil's filth and stench. Someone else may read too. He who wants to hear God speak should read the Holy Scripture. It's one of the most important sentences Martin Luther writes in this whole book. Because here he says, in other words, sola scriptura. If you want to hear God speak, read his word, understand his word, and make sure that you have the right Bible, that you have the correct understanding of the word of God, that you don't fall into any corrupted Bible where you do not get the full meaning of God's words. Because there are sentences, verses, even chapters left out, Words changed, meanings changed, words left out. You have to get a 1611 authorized King James Version for the full understanding of the book. He who wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. He who wants to hear God speak should stand on the Scripture solely, sola scriptura. But he who wants to hear the devil speak should read the Pope's decretals and bulls, or watch television, or be of this world. Everywhere in this world you hear the devil speak. You hear the devil speak through television, through the mainstream media, through the so-called alternative media. Though you hear the devil speak in every outlet in the internet, and in every outlet in the television, and movies, and radio stations, and newspapers and magazines and wherever. All that is full of the devil. If you want to hear the devil, if you want to read what the devil says, if you want to hear the devil speak, you should read the Pope's decretals and bulls and you should just be of this world and you will hear nothing else but the voice of the devil. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa unto him who comes along and becomes Pope or Cardinal. It would be better for him if he had never been born. Judas betrayed and killed the Lord, but the Pope betrays and brings ruin upon the Christian Church, which the Lord held more precious and dearer than himself or his blood. For the Lord sacrificed himself for the Church. Woe unto you, Pope! This is the origin of fearful raving and raging after the time of the Roman Empire. There they call themselves emperors and lords over kings and emperors, depose and dethrone them, let them kiss their feet, ban, murder and curse them. How they treated our German emperors, Frederick I and Frederick II, until they openly executed the sole heir Conrad with the sword. Philip, Henry the Fourth, and Henry the Fifth, and Louis the Bavarian. 
So we are going here into a little footnote that you understand all these people that I've just uh, uh, summed up for you. Philip, there he is speaking of Philip of Swabia, elected emperor in 1198. He had to fight Emperor Otto IV from 1209 through 1215, who, with the support of the Antichrist Pope Innocent III and several German princes, also claimed the imperial crown. Henry IV and Henry V were involved in the famous investiture controversy with Pope Gregory VII. Now, if you are not familiar with Henry IV and his famous investiture controversy with Antichrist Pope Gregory VII, then you have never heard of the Canossa story. Now, and what is this Canossa story? And don't expect me to go into that right now, because I'm not <laughs> doing that in the last ten minutes of this reading of the book. But you can uh, Google that yourself, or use any other church engine, whatever fits you. Um, and you just search the term Road to Canossa. And there you will read, for example, in uh, Wikipedia, that that is something that happened in the year 1077. And the dispute between the German Emperor Henry IV at that time and the Pope Gregory VII was that uh, the Emperor did not accept the, uh, the, the uh, complete temporal power of the Pope. And therefore, the Pope excommunicated the emperor and when he excommunicates an emperor that means that that emperor is made completely free to be killed of his people and the people of the uh, of his kingdom should not follow him anymore and then in the middle of the winter in 1077 Henry the fourth went through the Alps most of the time even barefooted to Canossa to repent in front of the Pope. And you can read that for yourself. That's a very interesting story to understand. And this is how we have to understand what Martin Luther speaks here about when he said how he treated our German emperors, in this case Henry the Fourth. You know, Henry IV and also Henry V were involved in the famous investiture controversy with Pope Gregory VII. From that comes the walk or, uh, to Canossa or the road to Canossa. And read about that for yourself, I ask you. Do your own research in that history and then you understand what Martin Luther speaks here about. They always wanted to make the empire headless. Who is they? The popes. They wanted to make the empire headless because as long as there was an emperor, like the emperor of the Holy Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire of German nation, as there was for a thousand years, from 800 to 1800, as long as there was such an emperor, the pope did not have both the powers combined in himself like he wants church and state to be combined. He doesn't want to share his power with any emperor or king or whatever, because he, the Pope, says that he is king of kings and lord of lords. Therefore, he says, I have the complete spiritual, I have the complete temporal power over the, over the world. And I will show that to you. And... He showed that in that way to Emperor Henry IV when he anathematized him, when he excommunicated him, and by that told the people in his Reich, in his kingdom, in his empire, that the people did not have to listen to him anymore. He was free to be killed. That's what happens when you are excommunicated by the Church of Rome. Everybody is free to kill you, and it is even a meritorious work. It is not even a crime, because you're a heretic. And to kill a heretic is a meritorious work, not a crime, not a sin, in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, this is so important that we understand that the Pope already was always against the German emperors. Frederick I, Frederick II, Conrad, Philip, Henry IV, Henry V, and Louis the Bavarian. 
so that uh, Louis is uh, one of the kings of Bavaria. And Bavaria, always an arch Catholic, uh, um, arch Catholic region in German, always was, still is, and probably always will be. Yeah? They always wanted to make the empire headless, so they always, the popes, always wanted to take away that civil power, that temporal power of the empire, make it headless, so that the pope could be emperor, so that the pope could be the temporal and the spiritual ruler in one person, king of kings and lord of lords. That's about what we have today, right? Because we have no Roman emperor anymore here in Europe. We have the United, uh, the European Union, yeah? this 27 or 28, I don't know, splitter states that form the European Union. And who is the head of that European Union? Well, <laughs> they tell you that it is the head of the, who, who is heading the European Commission. Uh, but actually, that is the Pope. He just hasn't been crowned yet Emperor of Europe. But that's going to come in the future. Because the wound is healing since 1929. And that's what we are experiencing today. So Martin Luther puts our attention here to the point that all throughout history they treated the German emperors in a way that they wanted to make the empire headless so that the Pope could be emperor. That is the end goal. That was the end goal in that time, that still is the end goal today. And not even only over Europe, but over the whole world. And there you have it, what most people say is the New World Order, but they don't understand, because it is nothing else but the restoration of the Old World Order, the time before the Reformation, when the power that the Pope had over all the kings of Europe was all of a sudden taken away. Because... In the Augsburg Confession, that is something that we go into a little bit later in this book, the reigning nobility of Germany allowed their people to worship God as they wanted to. They gave them freedom of worship. They gave them real freedom of religion. They gave them the possibility to worship the God of the Bible as the God of the Bible ordains it. Namely, to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That are the results of the Augsburg Confession of 1530 and the Diet of Augsburg. And that is where in 1529-1530 the word Protestant for the first time came up. I have not used the word Protestant today very much in this reading, but you know that I use the word Protestant all over my readings anywhere, everywhere. So now in the end I'm coming to that again. The protest at that time was that the German nobility protested in front of the Emperor, King Charles V, uh, Emperor Charles V, the, uh, the Emperor, the Kaiser, that their people would have freedom of religion as it was spoken of in the Bible. Not freedom of religion like you over there in the United States of America have, because that's a fake freedom of religion. The United States of America had freedom of religion until 1776. And then you allowed Catholics. Okay? But in, fift in 1530, the, with the Augsburg Confession, we will learn later on when we read, when, you co when we continue reading and understanding this book from Martin Luther, that the German nobility protested against the emperor and said, we are not listening to the spiritual teaching of the Pope in Rome. We are listening to the Bible and the Bible alone. And we allow also other people to adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone and not the Pope. Because Jesus Christ is the head of the church and not the Pope. So all the points that Martin Luther is making here, where the Pope says because of Matthew 16, the Pope claims the spiritual power over the people, the people understood as of the moment when they had the Bible in their own hands, 
that that was not the case, that Jesus Christ always was, is and always will be the only head of the church, because it is his church, it is not the church of the Pope, it is not the church of the Antichrist, it is the church of Christ. The Antichrist has just kidnapped that church, has stolen that church, has infiltrated that church, and then has made it sick with all his decretals and bulls. Woe, woe, woe unto him who comes along and becomes Pope or Cardinal, Martin Luther says therefore. Woe unto you, Pope! Judas betrayed and killed the Lord, which is worse enough, bad enough. But the Pope betrays and brings ruin upon the Christian church, upon the whole church, which the Lord himself held more precious and dearer than himself, or his own blood, for he sacrificed himself for it. Woe unto you, as Pope! And with this, I'm going to stop my reading for today. Until next time. York from Juggler 66 says, God bless you. Signing off and bye-bye.